So. Well, we're going to be learning about the cell tonight. I'm, uh, let me, and let me brief, briefly introduce myself a little better. I'm, uh, I'm one of the educators here at Cedar Park Christian Schools where I teach uh, high school science. So I teach biology and chemistry, human anatomy and physiology. I offer a class on biotechnology, and I offer a course on creation apologetics. So I teach a class with just this same kind of content. Well, I actually use this content in both my biology class. My biology students will get to hear lectures like this. My life science class will get to hear lectures like this. Um, and, uh, and then my apologetics class gets, uh, gets a lot more of them too. So it's, it's, a, it's a great thing and a very honoring thing to be able to teach at a Christian school and to be able to to help them with the conflicts that exist today between what science is teaching and what the Bible teaches, because that's our big goal in apologetics, is to help people reconcile the conflicts that exist today. And uh, for, for this reason and many others, science is very important. Science is important for a person of faith for many reasons. Um, one of the most important reasons is that we do need to reconcile the conflicts that exist today between what science is teaching and what the Bible teaches. These are in great conflict. So issues like the age of the earth are very, very, very significant conflicts. Um, whether or not God created the world versus whether it came about by purely natural process, these are conflicts that we need to help resolve. But science is also important for a person of faith because it's through science that we are learning about God's creation and the many wonderful things that he has made for us. And through such a study, we will in inevitably develop a better appreciation of our Father in heaven. So that's our main goal for tonight, to look at some of the wonderful things that he has made and uh, to tell him, thank you, Lord, and praise you, Lord, for the works that you have made. <clears throat> well, the microscopic world is really a, a, an amazing place. I've, uh, I've spent a lot of time on a microscope. I've, uh, I've, I've spent uh, more than a decade working in scientific industry before I started teaching at a Christian school. Um, I taught at, I, I worked at, the, uh, at a laboratory at Texas Tech that was called the Cotton Fiber Production Laboratory. This was a publicity photo taken for uh, the work that was being done in that particular lab. We were growing cotton cells in tissue culture and attempting them to grow to links that would allow them to be used by textile industries. So I was in charge of the big bioreactors and I would have to check my cultures periodically on the microscope to, to measure cell links and also to look for contaminations, bacteria, if there's any bacteria in the culture, and then I'd have to hit them with a dose of antibiotics and stuff. But I also worked at a, at a laboratory at, uh, at Oklahoma State, the plant transformation facility at Oklahoma State, where I uh, provided technical support for people needing to genetically transform plants. And then I was brought here by a biotech company over in Bothell called Eden Bioscience to, uh, genetic, to transform a number of plants for them as well. So because of this work, I've spent a lot of time on the microscope, a lot of time on the microscope, and I can tell you that entering this world, entering the microbial world can be a, a, a really amazing thing. There's a, a, a tremendous beauty there. There's a, a great symmetry to these microscopic forms, but a, a great beauty there as well, an elegance in the way they move. We're able to, under the microscope, to watch single-cell organisms like these and watch the elegant ways in which they move. And, you know, we are truly fortunate to live in a time when we do, when technologies have developed, microscopes and telescopes have, have developed that enable us to see parts of God's creation that no one ever saw before. We're the first person to see cells like this, first people to see that there were vast astronomical objects out there beyond our own galaxy. We're the first person to see some of these things. Well, Although microscope technologies existed be, uh, during Darwin's time, they knew very little about the cell. In fact, the cell theory, the theory that, uh, that, all, that organisms are made of cells and their products, that cells come only from pre-existing cells and that cells are the basic units of life, the, the very cell theory, what the cell was to living organisms wasn't known until about the same time Darwin published The Origin of Species. It was only forming about that same time, mid-1800s. And in fact, uh, during Darwin's day, most of the evolutionists believed that life could just spontaneously arise. 
It wasn't until 1859, the same year that Darwin published On the Origin of Species, that Louis Pasteur, shown here, conclusively disproved the theory of spontaneous generation by showing that microorganisms only appeared in a broth that he had in this flask when, it was inter- when they were introduced from the air. Conclusively disproved spontaneous generation in a, in a uh, world-acclaimed experiment. It was actually part of a contest put on by the French Academies of Science. So it was a world, worldwide acclaimed uh, experimental result. But despite the convincing and international acclaimed results of Pasteur, Pasteur's experiment, Ernst Haeckel, shown here, who was an evangelical promoter of uh, Darwin in Europe, continued to advocate for spontaneous generation on purely spiritual grounds. He said, and this is close to 20 years after Louis Pasteur's experiment, he said, if we do not accept the hypothesis of spontaneous generation, then at this one point in the history of evolution, we must have recourse to the miracle of supernatural creation. Haeckel chose spontaneous generation, although there was no empirical evidence to support it because he did not like the alternative, a belief in God. And evolutionists continue to accept and uphold the hypothesis of spontaneous generation today. Well, then in 1883, this same guy, Ernst Haeckel, 24 years after Pasteur's experiment, uh, committed an act of fraud to prove that life arose spontaneous, spontaneously on Earth. He claimed the existence of a simple organism that he named Monaran and described as a very primitive, primitive protocell that was not composed of any organs at all, but consists entirely of shapeless, simple, homogeneous matter. They're nothing more than a shapeless, mobile little lump of mucus or slime consisting of albuminous combinations of carbon. But where did Ernst Haeckel see these cells he described as simple little lumps of mucus or slime? Only in his imagination. They are a theoretical necessity for the theory of evolution. A simple cell must have existed before the complex cells we have today, so why not just go ahead and make it up, apparently? But it's not something that's ever been observed. However, this did not stop him from making more than 30 drawings of these imaginary Monerans, which along with 73 pages of speculations were published by a prestigious German scientific journal of the day. He also gave them scientific names like Proto-Amoeba Primitivia, because a primitive proto-amoeba must have existed before the complex amoebas we have today. But the extent of the details you see on his drawings really is the measure of his fraud, claiming to have discovered an organism that never existed. And it's important to understand that Ernst Haeckel, this man, was very, very important in advancing Darwin's theories. He almost single-handedly was responsible for having Darwinism accepted in Germany by Darwin's own words, and then by extension to Europe. This man, Ernst Haeckel, is largely responsible for having Darwinism accepted in Europe, and he did so by committing numerous acts of fraud, not just this one. Well, the height of his deception is, is also fully illustrated by the fact that he made similarly detailed but accurate drawings of other microscopic organisms like diatoms shown here. Diatoms are single-cell algae that are enclosed within a cell wall made of silica, which are found in these beautiful geometric and symmetrical forms. Shown here are a couple of plates of diatoms that, that Ernst Haeckel made for his book that was titled Art Forms in Nature. Haeckel had access to some of the most advanced optical technology of his day as a professor at Jena University, so he had absolutely no excuse for such inaccuracies in claiming the existence of these Monerans, and his work shows that he was well aware of the complexity of cellular forms. These single-cell organisms that you see here are far from shapeless, simple, homogeneous lumps of mucus. And isn't it amazing that someone can be so keenly aware of art forms in nature, the title of his book, and not be aware that there would be an artist behind art forms? Because when you find art, there's an artist. When you find engineering, there's an engineer. When you find designs, there's a designer. 
Well, new powerful microscopes like the electron microscope reveal even greater detail and the remarkable engineering possessed by microbes. The electron microscope shown here can magnify images up to 100,000 times and actually has a resolving power of up to two nanometers. At such magnifications, we can see the exquisite detail on the surface of diatoms. This is one of those same diatoms uh, magnified by one of these scanning electron microscopes or the engineering possessed by another diatom species. Just looking at cells under high power magnification cries out design. It cries out that I was made. Because I think if you found this any other place other than on a microscope, you would assume it had been made by the hands of an intelligent mind. If you found that on a beach laying somewhere, you would assume it would have been fashioned by the hands of an intelligent mind. But Scientists are reluctant to recognize the witness of their own eyes sometimes. Well, take a look at this coccolithophore. This is a viewed from a regular compound microscope. I wanted to show you what they look like under a regular microscope so you'll better appreciate what they look like on the scanning electron microscope. Now, I don't know if you could see it as the technician was focusing in, but this single cell organism coats itself in plates that are called uh, Coccoliths, so these little plates. I don't know how well you can see it, but take a look at this under the scanning electron microscope right here. Those are those protective plates that it covers itself with. The structural design features of the protective plates covering these cells should be enough to convince an observer of the reality of intelligent design. But again, a worldview can be a very blinding thing for a person, blinding them to even the most obvious of evidence. Well, what we have learned since Darwin's day is that the cell is tremendously complex. Drawing an analogy to describe the complexity of the cell is very difficult because there is nothing in human experience that compares to the complexity we find in the cell. A mar one of our marvels of modern technology pale in comparison. The cell has orders of magnitudes more moving parts than does a big jet airplane like a Boeing 747. More moving parts... Uh, by orders of magnitude, then a big factory making a whole bunch of Boeing 747s. The cell is truly more complex than an entire city. There's really nothing else you could really compare it to that even gets close. The cell is like a, an enormous city that has been shrunk down a microscopic scale. It is, in a, in a word, unparalleled in its complexity. There's nothing we can compare it to. Even a city pales in comparison <clears throat> it has countless molecular machines, some of these we call enzymes, factories full of machines, in fact. We call these factories organelles. It has a central library of information and a system to distribute that information within the city that is the cell. It has an infrastructure or a cytoskeleton that you're seeing here, and actually highways that assemble and disassemble and armies of delivery vehicles carrying manufactured goods from one part of the cell to another. Truly, the cell is unparalleled in its complexity and design. Well, Darwin and his contemporaries uh, didn't know about the complexity that we know of today. He stated, he stated this in On the Origin of Species. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ exists in which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down, but I can find out no such case. Well, today, we know that, there are min that many such things do exist. <clears throat> Darwinist contemporaries didn't know about molecular machines. There are machines in cells that could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications over multiple generations, such structures are termed irreducibly complex. Michael Behe, in his book Darwin Black, Darwin's Black Box, describes a, a test for, for intelligent design called irreducible complexity. And he argues that the machines in cells, these molecular machines, are themselves irreducibly complex. He describes it this way. He says, an irreducibly complex system is a single system which is composed of several interacting parts, like a mousetrap. He uses the mousetrap as an example. 
several interacting parts uh, that contribute to the basic function and where the removal of any one of these parts causes a system effectively to cease functioning. An irreducibly complex system cannot be produced gradually by slight successive modifications of a precursor system since any precursor to an irreducibly complex system is by definition non-functional. Machines are irreducibly complex. Machines, there are many, many machines so much more complex than a mousetrap, it it's, doesn't, the comparison really doesn't hold up. But a mousetrap is a very, very simple machine, yet you can understand that uh, you cannot assemble a mousetrap one piece at a time and have it be functional as you're assembling it. And yet that is exactly what must happen for Darwinian mechanisms to build something gradually. The, the machines in the cell have to be functional at every stage in its development. Yet, through Darwin's own words, numerous successive slight modifications are necessary to build everything. And yet machines, like a simple mousetrap, cannot be built like that. If you remove even one part of a mousetrap, it's not going to function. And it doesn't function if you have only one part there, or if you have two parts there, or three parts there, it's still not going to function. Until all the parts are there, and all the parts are assembled, it has to be created as an integrated whole. These molecular machines all fit this definition of irreducible complexity. Molecular machines that divide, defy Darwinian explanation for their origin are used for a variety of processes in cells, such as transporting substances. You have to look close, and you can see the highways in the cell. Can you see the substances being transported along these highways in the cell? There are machines, m armies of delivery vehicles transporting manufactured goods from one part of the cell to the next. Machines like the kinesin shown here. This is a little nanoscale micro walking robot that's carrying a package of manufactured goods from where it was made to elsewhere in the cell. And what you were seeing on that last video in those highways of the cell were armies of these little transportation vehicles carrying manufactured goods. Armies of uh, machines are also used for processes like cell division. This one has been sped up. It's an hour sequence that's been sped up, showing a cell in the process of dividing. But those are machines. All, every little bit of motion or, or movement that you see there is a little molecular machine doing its work to process this cell for cell division. Armies of machines are in there working. It's, it's incredible. It's incredible. Machines are also used for the movements of cells like these single-celled ciliates that are covered with little motors called cilium that work by a coordinated wave-like manner. They wave back and forth. And uh, they, in waving like this, they can help this little single-cell organism swim through water, or they can help it gulp down a meal as well. Look at this ciliate here. This big monster you see here is a ciliate that can be found in the guts of termites. So, but this is a single cell organism. This is one cell. But if, look at it, it even has a head. There's a head on, on the end of this little single cell organism. But this is ciliate. Those hairs are little motors that work in unison, in uh, concert with one another to accomplish the action of movement. Well, uh, <coughs> cilia are also uh, found in multicellular organisms. These are, this is lung cilia. So you actually, the cells that line your bronchial tubes secrete mucus and they have cilia that move the mucus up out of your lungs. So as you breathe in air, the particulates in the air will get stuck to the mucus that's uh, lining your bronchioles and then the cilia will move it up out of your lungs. So your lungs are constantly self-cleaning. It's pretty amazing. Well, a cross-section of the cilium, of one of these cilium, reveals some of the engineering there inside the cilia. Notice that you see uh, these bundles. You have the little these um, the circles that you see in this cross cross section are microtubules, which are actually uh, the same structure that that walking robot was walking down. That was also a microtubule. They're used for many functions. They're used to pull chromosomes apart during cell division as well. But in this case, it's a, it's used as a structural molecule for the cilium. So you can see there's a pair of microtubules in the center and then nine pairs going along the outside edge. This three-dimensional engineering diagram from the National Library of Medicine illustrates how the me mechanical parts of the machine fit together. 
but literally you have to use an engineering diagram to, uh, to, to illustrate some of this. Well, let me show you how the cilium works. The cilium moves, again, in a side-by-side -side manner, side-by-side wave-like manner, due to motor proteins that, that are part of the cilium. Um, it has a motor protein called a diene. I will circle them for you there. What these dienes do is they reach over and grab a hold of the neighboring microtubule. Remember, those circles are actually long tubes that run the length of the cilium. Well, there's a little motor protein that will reach over and grab on the neighboring microtubule and push on it. But then there's another important structure that I'll label the nexin that you see right there uh, links the neighboring microtubules together. Uh, this architecture works to accomplish the bending motion, and I'll show you how. Um, if, the, uh, if there are no nexin linkers, if those linker proteins are not there, when the dienes push down on the neighboring microtubule, one will slide down in relation to the next. But you, what you want is for the structure to bend. So, but because they're linked together, because those nexins are there linking those pairs of microtubules together, when the motor protein pushes down on the neighbor, the structure bends side to side. Well, like all machines that requires multiple parts and machines that require, mul that require multiple parts to function are again irreducibly complex and defy Darwinian explanations for their origin. Michael Behe uh, describes the, the, the irreducibly complex nature of the cilium. He is a professor of biochemistry at Lehigh University. He said, what components are needed for the cilium to work? Ciliary motion requires microtubules, otherwise there would be no strands to slide. Additionally, it requires the motor, that's the dienes, <clears throat> or else the microtubules of the cilium would lie stiff and motionless. Furthermore, it requires the nexin linkers to tug on neighboring strands, converting the sliding motion into bending motion and preventing the structure from falling apart. All of these are required to perform one function, ciliary motion. Well, let me show you some other machines. This, uh, this, and this is another important molecular machine in the cell called ATP synthase. It's a massive enzymatic complex composed of 500 separate protein subunits. And it is so important to the cell that the discoverers of this m motor were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1997. Well, the machine makes the energy-carrying molecule called ATP. It makes this molecule. To understand the importance of ATP, you use and remake half of your body weight in ATP every single day every single day. You make and reuse half your body weights in ATP. And uh, uh, poisons like cy cyanide is one of these really nasty poisons. Cyanide will kill you in 30 seconds because it blocks ATP synthesis. Okay, it's an extremely important molecule. It is the energy carrier that provides energy for every cellular function that needs energy. Muscle contraction needs ATP energy. Nerve impulses need ATP energy. To make anything in the cell needs energy. So it all gets that energy from ATP. Okay, well the factory that makes this ATP that has that little, ter that little uh, ATP synthase is the mitochondria. <clears throat> just, uh, I just trying to give you a little bit of good cell biology here in addition to everything else. The, so this is the, what the, the organelle looks like that makes the ATP. And uh, making ATP requires an entire army of enzymes to catalyze each stage of the breakdown of the glucose molecule. So plants, you know, make sugar for, in photosynthesis. They make this molecule glucose in photosynthesis. We eat plants be, mainly because we need that glucose molecule that plants make in photosynthesis because we use that glucose molecule, what we call blood sugar, to make ATP, okay? So the reason why you eat sugar, eat glucose, is because you need it to make ATP, because ATP powers all your chemical reactions. Well, I don't know if I want to labor this diagram much, but some of this is on the quiz, so you need to pay attention. Okay, I'm a, uh, it's really hard for me to uh, point at stuff on the screen with the setup that I have now, so the enzyme names are actually between, I don't know if I can get up here, are the pink names that are between the individual molecules. So there's an enzyme right there, isocitrate dehydrogenase, catalyzes the, re, the, the breakdown of isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate. Then you'll see another enzyme right here, alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, 
catalyzes this chemical reaction, converting alpha-ketoglutarate to succinyl-CoA. Then there's another enzyme needed right here, succinyl-CoA synthase, that catalyzes this reaction. Another one catalyzes this reaction. That enzyme right there catalyzes this reaction. Another enzyme catalyzes this one. You have to have and all of these enzymes to catalyze or perform each of these individual chemical reactions. And what, but what you're doing in this whole process of chemical reactions is you're making these molecules right here, NADH, you're making that NADH, and you're making FADH, there's an NADH over there, and there's an NADH. You're making those NADH molecules because those are used to power the ATP synthase, which is itself a tiny molecular turbine motor. This thing spins, it's the spin of it is driven by proton motive force, a complex chemical reaction. This thing spins at 200 revolutions per second and makes three ATP molecules every time it spins. So it's incredibly complex. You have to have all of these enzymes. You have to have all of those enzymes that are necessary to catalyze each stage of the breakdown of the glucose molecule which you eventually just breathe off as carbon dioxide. That's why you breathe off carbon dioxide from the breakdown of glucose. You need all those enzymes. And there's a breakdown, all of those molecules to make all those FADHs. And you need the ATP synthase with its 500 individual protein subunits. But to need ATP, you also need ATP. So uh, explain that, you know, from an evolutionary perspective. How do you get all of those machines to make something and also have to have the thing that it makes to make the thing that it makes. Yeah, very difficult. Well, another molecular machine is the flagellum. Flagellum shown here. You can see this little single cell organism extending out its flagellum and then it starts to spin it a little bit and then pull it back in. You can see, uh, you can see it trying to get its flagellum uh, um, pulled out there. Here's another one that show, that's a little better showing it swimming with its flagellum. So flagellum is used similar to the cilia except it spins. It is like an outboard motor spinning and uh, it, it, they, it, these single cell organisms use it to pull themselves through water. Single cell organisms like the ones you see here, the euglenoids have them, but bacteria also have them. These are bacteria swimming with their little flagellum. And they are, I don't know if you can tell, but they swim incredibly fast. I did a little calculation on this. They're swimming at 60 cell lengths per second, which if you compare that to the body length of a cheetah, uh, it, I, I calculate that to be 164 miles per hour, that the bacteria was re relative to the cheetah swimming uh, uh, or, 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 or running 68 miles an hour at 25 body lengths per second. It's, so anyway, I... I had to look it up to find out how fast are these things really swimming because they seem to be swimming crazy fast. Well, they're, again, they're swimming with the flagellum. They have this outboard motor. It is a nanomachine that is built using information from approximately 50 different genes and is composed of somewhere between, somewhere close to 40 different proteins, depending on the species. Each of these proteins is, uh, can be found in multiple copies, ranging from just a few to others up to tens of thousands of proteins. The bacteria then constructs this complex nanoscale structure more efficiently than any human design process. And everyone recognizes that this is a machine. And it, resembles a machine designed by humans. David uh, Rosier is an, uh, actually a flagellar expert who says that very same thing in the prestigious journal Cell. The, res the flagellum resembles a machine designed by humans. If it resembles something that's designed, perhaps there's a designer behind it, you know, because that's how science is supposed to work. Your past human experience is supposed to inform your, your observations to reach a conclusion. Well, the flagellum is the world's smallest rotary propulsion system. It has all the parts that we place in our own motors. It's constructed of proteins rather than metals and plastics, the way we construct things today. But these proteins all serve different functions. Some serve as the rotary motor. It literally has a rotary motor made of proteins. Others serve as the bushings. Others serve as a drive shaft. There's a rotation switch regulator. There's a universal joint. There's a helical propel propeller. And uh, it actually has a rotary promoter for self-assembly. In every way, 
It truly resembles a machine designed by humans, as David Rosier said. But evolutionists argue that it was not designed, but rather evolved. And they argue that it was evolved by co-opting or using proteins in the cell that were just being used for other purposes. And evolutionists assert that the bacterial flagellum was created in this way. However, the flagellum has 40 structural proteins and 30 of them. A full 75% of the proteins used in the flagellum are found nowhere else in the cell. They're unique to the flagellum. <clears throat> and let me remind again of the Monerans that Ernst Takel fabricated because the organism, the actual organism bacteria that were later assigned to this taxa that was named, uh, that, was, that Ernst Takel named, are in fact in possession of the most complex molecular machine we are aware of. And yet the Monerans, he described as simple little lumps of mucus or slime. He made up these cells, claiming they were simple little lumps of mucus or slime. But, and the bacteria ended up being given the name Monerant originally. They were, the, they were assigned to the kingdom Monera originally. Now they're in, the, the, the names have changed. Now they're in the kingdom Archibacteria and Eubacteria. But it's interesting that the, that the kingdom Monera, where the bacteria were assigned uh, end up uh, having one of the most complex molecular machines we're aware of. Well, one of the most spectacular discoveries of our generation is that information governs the biological world. Well, biological information exists in the cells of all organisms as this complex molecule called DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid. This molecule carries coded instructions for the assembly and use of proteins. And proteins are the machinery and the material that make life possible. Proteins do everything, and they, in a lot of cases, they are everything. <clears throat> They're all the molecular machines are made of proteins, but uh, proteins are also the building blocks for a lot of structures. Your fingernail and your hair, for example, are made of pure protein. But there's a protein machinery. They're making those proteins to make your fingernails and your hairs. <clears throat> and everyone acknowledges that DNA is information. Even Bill Gates says that it is by far the most sophisticated program around. Everyone acknowledges that it's information. Well, the fact that DNA is coded information causes it to stand as the single most powerful argument for intelligent design that there is. Because in all human experience, information invariably originates from an intelligent source, from a mind or a personal agent. When it was then discovered that information governed the biological world, it should have led to the conclusion that DNA was also the result of an intelligent mind. Because again, that house is how science is supposed to work. In all human experience, information only comes from an intelligent mind. When we discovered there was information in cells, it should have led to the conclusion that that information was also the result of an intelligent mind. Because again, that's how science is supposed to work. <laughs> Since intelligence is the only known cause of specified information, the presence of such information-bearing sequences in biological systems points definitively to the designing intelligence behind life on Earth. Well, the amount of information packed in each and every cell in our bodies is mind-boggling. To illustrate this, the DNA, DNA molecule is shaped like a ladder that's twisted. Okay, you see the shape there on the screen. That's called the double helix. Well, each step or rung along that, of that ladder is made up of one of four possible molecules called nucleotides that are abbreviated with the letters A, T, C, and G. So what you see to the right of that DNA molecule is actually DNA sequencing data. I did lots and lots of sequencing gels when I was a technician at Texas Tech, which is the black and white thing that you see there between the, between the DNA molecule and the, the, DNA, the sequencing information is actually a DNA sequencing gel. That's how you determine the, the sequence of the A, T, C's, and G's on a, G, on a DNA molecule. Well, if the A, T, C's, and G's of the DNA molecule are viewed as equivalent to the letters in our alphabet, then the amount of information in one human cell is approximately equivalent to a thousand books. Okay? The number of letters 
in one human cell is equivalent to the number of letters that is in a thousand books. Or to put it another way, a, a small little pinhead pile, uh, pinhead size pile of DNA, a size, a pile of DNA that's only about two millimeters in size, has about as much information as there are in 500 stacks of books reaching the moon or a single stack of books reaching the sun. The amount of information in a pile of DNA the size of a pinhead would fill a stack of books 93 million miles high. It is an incredible data storage system. And where do evolutionists believe all of this information came from? Well, random mutations. They believe that random changes to the genetic code gave rise to more genetic code. And this is literally one of the most ludicrous aspects of the theory of evolution that, that there is. And this is from someone with a fairly strong background in molecular genetics. I've talked to a, a number of people uh, through the years, and, uh, and most people will admit this, behind closed doors at least, that random mutations being a credible source of information seems ludicrous. And of course it does. It's an affront to reason. It's a affront to logic. It's a affront to common sense to propose that you can randomly change the letters in a book and create a second book, or to create a better book by randomly changing letters. But that is exactly what they claim. But we all know that you go randomly changing letters and you're not gonna create information, you will destroy information, and that's exactly what happens. Well, let me show you a little video uh, that just emphasizes some of the extraordinary design that we see in DNA. If simple water molecules that form ice crystals exhibit magnificent structure, consider the design ingenuity behind large, complex molecules, such as DNA. DNA contains the blueprint for all life and is by far the densest information storage mechanism known in the universe. For example, the amount of information contained in a pinhead volume of DNA would fill a stack of books 500 times higher than from here to the moon. The program code and design of such an incredible system indicates a supremely intelligent designer. The evidence to me that just cries out that there's a God is the study of DNA. DNA is a very powerful, massive information storage system. In fact, DNA that makes up our genes actually is like books of information that's read by a language system. It's absolutely phenomenal. And scientists know today that language as a code only come from an intelligence and information only comes from information. Nobody's ever seen matter by itself give rise to a code. Nobody's ever seen matter by itself give rise to information. And as you look at DNA, it actually cries out in the beginning, God created the universe. We all begin as a single cell the size of a period at the end of a sentence. How does that cell know how to build a, a body with 100 trillion uh, cells in it, thousands of different kinds, and each one of them is so complex, nanochemical machinery beyond our comprehension how it works, and encoded is the instruction manual it's the manufacturer's manual how to build and operate every part of this incredible body made up of 100 trillion cells. Furthermore, DNA is a three-dimensional molecule that is self-replicating. Each molecule is able to make an identical copy quickly and efficiently. The Lord has even programmed DNA to detect and correct replication errors. These sophisticated capabilities far exceed man's means.
God has created the DNA molecule in such a way that it is self-correcting. There are special proteins called enzymes that go up and down the DNA molecule looking for and making repairs on a minute-by-minute, second-by-second basis. God created us with a DNA code that actually has what we call editase or editorial type enzymes. Just as an editor reads a newspaper or a book looking for mistakes, so God has created special enzymes enzymes that go up and down our DNA molecule, repairing the mistakes in ways that are unbelievably complex. There are many examples in creation of, of things that demonstrate the biblical God. Uh, one would be in our very DNA. Our DNA has information in it. And there is a whole field of scientific study called information science, which studies how information originates, how it's transmitted, and so on. And one of the laws of information science says that information never originates by itself in matter, never spontaneously comes about. Anytime we trace uh, the copying of information back to its source, it always, it always comes back to a mind. And since we have creative information in DNA, that tells me that DNA comes from intelligence. It's not something that could possibly come about through millions of years of mutations and natural selection. That just won't work. Yet even the DNA molecule is simple compared to cells. All life consists of cells, and each cell functions as a miniature city. When we consider that a human body consists of trillions of cells working together as one unit, we should be in humble awe of our Creator's intimate care and perfect wisdom. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the fact is there is overwhelming evidence for intelligent design within the biological world. Technologies have given us looks at cells that no one has ever seen before. These cells are not simple little lumps of mucus or slime. There's a, an elegance to them. There is a, a symmetry to them that is just beautiful. <clears throat> They're more complex than anyone of Darwin's day could have imagined. The discovery that information governed the biological world and that molecular machines are responsible for cellular work should have led scientists to the conclusion that intelligent causation was responsible. But despite the overwhelming evidence of design found in the cell, a scientist that is committed to naturalism must refuse to acknowledge the obvious implications of their observations that the world was created. Francis Crick, shown here, was one of the co-discoverers of the DNA helix. He won the Nobel Prize for the discovery in 1962. He admits to seeing evidence of design but states that biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. They refuse to accept the witness of their own eyes. God has made the world with abundant evidence that it was created, but why can these natural scientists not see the truth? Paul speaks to this in Romans. For, he says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes... His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Then listen to this. For even though they knew God, knew that he was the creator, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. That is the world we live on. That is the nature of science education today. Well, if you want to take the quiz for tonight's program, I'll, I'll uh, leave that one up on the screen. You can take a scan of that. Let me close out in a word of prayer. Father God, we uh, are humbled to know that, that such great love exists. Lord, humbled to know that, uh, that such effort and time and love went into the creation of this world, Lord. We are uh, humbled to realize that such tremendous design exists, that such tremendous complexity is, is found within the world that you made for us, Lord God. We're humbled to know that such love exists, Lord. Father God, we, uh, we ask for wisdom, Lord. We ask for wisdom and insight, Lord. We, uh, we need your help to understand the science, to understand the arguments that are being used today to convince people there is no God, to convince people that all of this came about through purity natural processes. We need your help, Lord. We need wisdom. We need insight, Lord. Give us wisdom. Help us understand the science. Help us understand the claims, Lord. 
so that we can be a better witness for you, Father God. And Lord, help us to be bold, to not shrink back or to be reluctant to, uh, to, sh- to give our testimony about how we were saved from our sins, Lord. Help us to not shrink back from, to give our testimony about your creation, to tell people that you made this world, this wonderful, wonderful world. Help us to be bold, Lord. When we find opportunities for other God to speak of the beauties of your creation, to speak of the love that you have for us, Lord, help us to be bold, Father God. We ask for boldness and we ask for wisdom, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for everything that you've done for us, Lord, for making this wonderful, wonderful world for us. We thank you so much, Lord. We praise you, Father God. And we thank you for sending your son. For sending your son to die for our sins, Lord. Father God, I'm so sorry. So, so sorry for my sins, Lord. So, so sorry that my sins, it was my sins that made it necessary for your son to die. To come and die in such a horrible way, Father God. I'm humbled to know that such great love exists, Lord. And I, uh, I bow before you this evening and asking for the forgiveness of sins, Lord. Forgive me of my sins, Lord, in the name of your son, Yeshua. Father God, be with us this week, Lord, and send your Holy Spirit to us. Convict us, Lord, during the day. Guide us to the path of righteousness, Father God, and help us to be a a servant and a witness for you, Father God. We will do our best, Father God, to live a life that glorifies and honors you, to live a life that's free of sin, and to testify the truths of your creation in your son, Jesus Christ. Praise your name. Praise your name. We ask all this in the name of your son, Yeshua. Amen.